Good evening to all of you. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to this eminent educators colloquium agenda setting for leadership organized by OP Jindal Global University in collaboration with Education World. The theme of today's colloquium is the future of education, global citizenship. I have a very distinguished set of institution builders and principles of leading schools of India, along with a few other educators as well. Welcome all of you to this fortnightly talk show, talk show being organized by IIHED and JGU. One of the remarkable things about the current times that we're living in is that most important notions of education have been challenged. The world is increasingly more and more becoming interconnected and interdependent, yet is being impacted by events that we have no control over. The coronavirus global pandemic has once again proved this fact. The immediate public policy response around the world was to temporarily restrict all kinds of mobility around the world to contain the virus, raising questions about the process of globalization. However, soon everybody realized that we cannot survive in a state of infinite lockdown. Human civilization cannot survive in total social and economic isolation. Since ancient times in history, humans communicated, traveled, shared ideas, and traded across civilizations. Though the current process of globalization in the 21st century have heightened the speed at which people, money, ideas, ideology, dreams, aspirations, and desires travel around the world, the fact remains that some of those fundamental notions are at challenge now. Every local problem in the 21st century related to environment and climate change public health and emergency, quality education, inequality, refugees, even migrant crisis, and the big problem of terrorism is global in nature. Individual nations cannot deal with this crisis on their own. We need to build global solidarity and cooperation in the long run to deal with these problems. In fact, educators within the Indian context, such as Rabindranath Tagore and Krishnamurti and global think tanks such as UNESCO have been advocating for a vision for global citizenship for a long time. However, we also know that citizenship education in almost every country around the world has remained within the national curriculum framework. In this evening's colloquium, we will be deliberating on the need to urgently teach for global citizenship to our future citizens, which needs active participation of citizenship rights and duties at the local level in order to achieve this objective as a part of our sustainable development goals. I have great pleasure in introducing my very distinguished guest today. Dr. Gunmeet Bindra is the founding principal of Delhi Public School, Rajpura, and former principal, Bellum Boys School, Dehradun. She's an alumna of the Delhi School of Economics and Calcutta University, is the first woman to head a boys boarding school in India an accomplished educationist with over 30 years of experience in teaching and school administration. She has held many coveted positions, including the member of the CBSC governing body and British Council School Ambassador in India. She has been conferred numerous awards, including the CBSC National Award for Teachers in 2014, presented by the Honorable President of India, Sri Pranam Mukherjee, the Uttarakhand Ratan Award, presented by the Chief Minister of Uttarakhand, and the National Award for Instructional Leadership in the Principals category of the awards at the NDTV Educom Education Awards 2016. Welcome, Dr. Mindra. Thank you so much, Professor. We have with us Mr. Roshan Gandhi, who is the Director of Strategy at the City Montessori School, Lucknow. Mr. Gandhi earned his bachelor's degree from Oxford and pursued MBA from, MBA from UCL, Institute of Education, Educational Leadership and Management. Born and brought up in London, Mr. Gandhi believes that India could learn from the best about integrating skills development like leadership skills, analytical skills, life skills, and communication skills. And the West can learn dedication and sacrifice for the sake of education from India. Mr. Gandhi is also a passionate musician who has toured the world with his band and is, um, is affiliated with the Associate Board of the Royal School of Music London for Western Classical Music, both vocal and violin. Thank you very much, Mr. Gandhi, for joining us in this evening's colloquium. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. We have with us uh, Lieutenant General Mr. Surinder Kulkarni, is the director of Mayo College, Ajmer. Lieutenant General has served in the army for nearly four decades. In his long and distinguished career, he has commanded the largest forces, held some of the most prestigious assignments, and has been awarded numerous distinguished service awards. Parallel to his army career, Lieutenant General Kulkarni, an alumnus of Mayo College, Ajmer, pursued his academic interests. He is an economics graduate from Ferguson College, Pune. He has four master's degrees, including an MSc and an MPhil degree. 
is taught at the Armored Corp Center and School Ahmed, uh, Ahmednagar Institute of Armament Technology, Pune, and the Defense Services Staff College, Wellington. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lieutenant General Kulkarni, for joining us today. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Have with us, Mr. Dilip Tharkor, who is, uh, of course, uh, my partner in crime. Uh, is the publisher and editor of Education World and uh, Parents World. Since November 1999, the publisher and editor of Education World, the human development magazine. Education World is India's and possibly Asia's first education news and analysis magazine with a national readership comprising academics, parents, and high school students. Our estimated readership is about 1 million across the country. Earlier, he has found editor of, he was the founding editor of Business India and Business World, India's first two business magazines, which catalyzed the economic liberalization and the deregulation initiative of 1991. Thank you very much, Dilip, for joining us in this initiative. Thanks now, for the very generous intro. I have my colleague, Dr. Maushmi Mukherjee, an associate professor and deputy director of IHD at OP Jindal Global University. Maushmi is a Fulbright scholar and education expert with two decades of experience in the school education and higher education sector. She has worked in teacher education and professional development in the United States, Saudi Arabia, Australia, and India. She has worked as an expert consultant with international organizations such as UNESCO and IEP, Toronto-based Higher Education Strategy Associates, and Australia India Institute at the University of Melbourne. Recently, she also worked with the National Council for Education Research and Training in India as an external resource person to help develop a handbook for upper primary school teachers on global citizenship education. Thank you, Moshmi, for joining us in this program. Thank you, Professor, and it's a pleasure. Well, thank you very much to all of you. And we are, of course, having this program at an extraordinary time when education institutions, including schools, colleges, universities, have been fundamentally asked to reimagine their future. While the present is staring at us, we are talking about the future of education as well. So my first question is to Dr. Bindra. Dr. Bindra, global citizenship, by its very definition, includes a commitment to the collective or common good. Is it really possible and really important for us to think about common good when nation states are so ready even to go to war or retaliation with all kinds of triggers because of local regional politics as well. How can we teach about global common good in a context of conflict and disharmony when our societies are unfortunately at times divided over issues of nationality, race, class, gender, sexuality, and many other divisions? Dr. Mindra. Thank you, Professor, for that question. Before I go on to answer that question, I must first congratulate you all for selecting this topic. While the entire <clears throat> world is going mad in talking about online teaching, y'all have taken a topic which has been hitherto neglected. And what better time than now to be talking about this? I must also, before answering this question, express that I'm extremely privileged and humbled to be part of this initiative, sharing this space with the likes of the dignitaries that we have, Dilip Thakur, I mean, I, in my introduction, spoke about a number of awards, but the one closest to my heart is the one that has been awarded by the education world over and over again. Now coming to this question of teaching common good. So I want to look at common good in the context of the global citizenship, citizenship education that you just mentioned. Now, when we talk of uh, common good in relation to that, then the first thing that one must understand is that global citizenship education has to be brought into the curriculum as a conscious effort. It's sad that today, leave alone students, even a large chunk of teachers and leave alone teachers, even a large chunk of leaders, principals would not be able to give you even half of the 17 sustainable goals. It's a very sad situation, but that's the reality. So the first thing is, we, it's nice to talk about policymakers at the national level, state level, and all of that. I am an educationist and I'm a grassroots level worker. So I want to begin with the principles. So the first thing up is that the principles stand the responsibility of creating a cascading and a ripple effect amongst their own community to bring about consciousness for the need, consciousness of the need for global citizenship education. Now within global citizenship education, specifically to talk about common good 
as a, a value to be taught. I think like all other values, common good is also something that is, that is more to be caught than to be taught. What really is common good? We all understand what's good for everyone. So that common good is, is there's no debate on that. The situation becomes difficult and becomes an issue when we, we are not in agreement with what is common good. Who decides what's common good for everyone? Is there a unanimity on what is common good? That is the question. So to me, teaching common good is actually teaching the children to be able to deal with situations, to deal with dilemmas. And it's not just to think about what is common good. It's not about sharing a vision. It's about sharing the pursuit to that, to the achievement of that vision. I'll, I'll, and, and very importantly, when we talk about teaching or imbibing, I always feel age appropriateness is a very important factor. So uh, we, we can talk about, uh, say, the US uh, withdrawing from the Paris climate change because Trump openly says it's in con it's, uh, his withdrawal is in line with his America first policy. Overwhelmingly negative response. He sets up the US climate exchange. So what is common good? If at that level, it can be so overwhelmingly uh, 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 different for everyone, then what are we talking about children? I do something very interesting, Professor Rajkumar, with my children. I put them through situations which pose a dilemma. You know, in Hindi, you would call them dharm sankat. So I'll give you an example. So uh, my favorite is I put up this to the children. They're staying in a, in a gated community, which has over 500 flats. And there is one uncle in the, in the community. And that uncle, let's say Uncle John, is the best man in the community. And anyone who has a problem goes to Uncle John. And Uncle John is a ready, one-stop answer. So if the woman has to go for work, there's no one to take care of the child, Uncle John. If mother's fallen ill, no driver, Uncle John. Such, he is the Uncle John. And one day, you're playing with your friends in the, in the community park. And a police van stops by and shows you Uncle John's picture and says, uh, have you seen this man? You know he's Uncle John. And you ask him why. He says he fled from prison about 12 years ago on charges of multiple. And we've heard that he's hiding in this community, in this, in this, uh, uh, community, in this uh, uh, apartment. Or would you... Not this close uncle. Now, common good. Is it common good to hand him over to the police or is it not common good to hand over to the police? I am taking it to the children's level. I'm not taking to the larger things like no hunger and uh, uh, gender equality and all of that. As a teacher, I'm take, talking about age appropriate imbibing of knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes to deal with and to think about common good. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Bindra, for really setting the stage for what we intend to discuss in the course of uh, this evening's program. Let me move to General Kulkarni. General Kulkarni, uh, what role you think schools can play in fostering in learners uh, an understanding of different levels of identity? And in many ways, uh, to focus on the potential for development of a collective identity which transcends beyond individual, cultural, religious, ethnic, or other differences. Uh, Amartya Sen famously delivered a lecture at Oxford entitled Reason Before Identity. And how can uh, we teach our students the importance of universal, universality, uh, both the common collective identity principle, but also values such as interest and participation and duty while respecting singularity, including individual rights and self-development and improvement. Now, you have, of course, been uh, in the armed forces and now uh, heading a school, and I've had good experience in educational uh, imagination. How do we take this into our school system? Thank you, Professor. To begin with, this whole notion of citizenship and national identity and all is less than a 400 years old concept. As you are well aware, it all started with the Treaty of Westphalia, right? Now, to the child of today, or those, even the millennials, this is even more confusing. So I belong to the Soviet Union, but now I belong to Belarus. I, I belong to uh, you know, Yugoslavia, but now I belong to Serbia. 
Similarly, Dhaka was in British India, then it was in pa Pakistan, now it's in Bangladesh. So a political idea with a geographical dimension is what is often being def defined as a nation state. And therefore, it is very confusing to a child, right? What is the nation state concept of Satya Nadella who went from Hyderabad to the US, correct? Today, the US citizen, I presume, and a very loyal one. So therefore, therefore, this whole idea of trying to explain citizenship in the context of countries creates confusion in the minds of our students. It is better to create this sense of identity in the context of a cultural identity. And you will find that people relate to a cultural identity much more. So whereas geographically you can box in people and divide them and within the country divide them into states like a federal India, what you can't divide is commerce, communications, travel, uh, information flow. So therefore, when this is universal, and even the flow of population, you see the number of migrants who leave North Africa and try and hit Europe, right? So therefore, or the internal migrations that happen in societies in our own country. So, or even transitional ones, which happen seasonally as per the need of the labor force. So therefore, to create a sense of identity based on geography or based on a political identity creates confusion in the minds of young growing up children. So therefore, what we need to focus on and with tomorrow's, you know, the so-called global village, and of course the world is no more looking flat, but it was supposed to become flat. The discourse is changing. And where we need to drive the discourse of our children is this, that we need to expose them to more and more people with differences so that they can identify what are the commonalities. Because every time you harp on a difference and you meet somebody else, you suddenly discover that actually there's a lot in common. Human values are quite common. They're universal in different religions, in different texts, in, in different writings of authors. So therefore, to my mind, exposing our children to ideas and people from outside the world. And for schools like where Dr. Bindra was in Wellam Boys and my school and all, there's a very strong international program for this. So there are a lot of exchanges outward and at least about 15% of my students go out every year, minus this year, of course. And all of them get exposed to a lot of foreigners coming in. And therefore, I mean, I, I run a, a program because sometimes it's important to put a little a, a label or a tagline, which is easier to correlate. I call it global boots with Indian roots. They, our children must be culturally rooted in the milieu that they come from. That they must never lose sight of. And if they hold on to that and they reach out to those things which are common in the world and the concept of good is common everywhere. Ma'am referred to the sustainable development goals. Politicians can come and say what they want. But the issue of shortage of water will remain. The issue of women's empowerment will remain. The issue of universalization of education will remain. It doesn't matter which country and which politician comes. So our children have to be told that they can make a difference tomorrow. And they must start small with small success. I tell my guys, don't try and solve global warming. Tell me, how will you prevent water from you know, overflowing or running out of my campus? Tell me, how will you, you know, make sure our wells get charged in my own school? That, to my mind, is a sustainable development goal and not some global warming, that's okay in a beauty pageant when you say, I will don't want to see a single child going to sleep in tears and all that. But it's not good for the real world. Thank you very much, Chal Kulkarni. In fact, I want to take that to uh, Mr. Gandhi. Mr. Gandhi, one of the big challenges of speaking about global citizenship is that how do we relate uh, to uh, more local concerns? Of course, we know that the COVID-19 crisis uh, has created a, a very strong reminder of building institutional capacities within societies. But it also gives opportunity for us to recognize the important role played by uh, in an effort to promote global citizenship education. So given the increasingly interdependent and global nature of our problems, including the pandemic that we're facing, how important it is to make global citizenship education a very critical and a central component of the school curriculum. Most of the courses that get taught do have challenges with regard to being, you know, uh, more uh, outdated at some level, but also not in tune with certain contemporary realities. How do schools 
need to reimagine their curriculum with a stronger focus on global citizenship education. Mr. Gandhi. Well, thank you so much for having me and, and thank you for the, the fascinating question. Um, I, I was really interested to hear the insights of the speakers uh, who just spoke and, and I want to pick up on that in answering this question. Um, in particular, you know, when it comes to global citizenship, I mean, one has to ask, you know, what, what does that consist of? It's an attitude which someone holds. It's a feeling of identity, of being part of something greater than oneself. Um, and it's, a, it's an ideology of unity, of a feeling that the human race, they have their own special identities and yet they are fundamentally one. And so the question is, um, if, if it's about unity, then do we have unity at home? Before we start thinking about global citizenship, we need to look in our classroom and think, how is the upper caste child treating the lower caste child? How is the Hindu child treating the Muslim child? How is the IAS officer's child in the class treating the rickshawala's child in the class? You know, these, these aspects of unity have to be taken care of first. Uh, and that is basically the prerequisite to then instilling a sense of global citizenship. And I think the way to do that, you, know, you ask about how to integrate it into the curriculum. I think one thing is very clear because it's an attitude rather than a piece of knowledge. It's not something that can really be taught in a theoretical way. There should be no global citizenship period. Rather, it's something that needs to, you know, to, to be pervading the culture of the school and the, the behavior that has to be modeled by the teachers in all classes. So yes, to some extent, it can be integrated in a curricular fashion. There are certain subjects which discuss world issues, for example, geography, history, and it's possible to try to tailor a curriculum in those subjects in such a way that global issues and it matters of global identity and citizenship are covered, that, that um, the, the, the interconnectedness of the world in, in a globalized world, uh, or, or the fact that you know, there are global problems which can only be solved with global solutions, that sort of thing can be taught through a geog geography curriculum or a history curriculum. But what is more important is that teachers model a particular behavior in their attitudes in the class. Um, you know, and, and, and how do you do that? Well, I mean, it, it starts at the very beginning. If a school is really serious about prioritizing a global citizenship education and attitudes, then at the time of recruiting teachers, they need to think about, you know, do, do teachers have these attitudes really? Um, in, in their, they need to be brought out in the interview. Then that needs to be reflected in training. And of course, most importantly, it needs to be reflected in the organizational culture, which is modeled by the school leaders. Um, you know, as, as Dr. Gunmeet rightly said, it, it comes down to the, in the first place, to the principal modeling that behavior in the right way. So when that happens, then the right attitudes can start to percolate into the class. Um, you know, we can take a very small example. Uh, just last week, the Unilever company finally decided to change the name of the fair and lovely to just lovely, right? It, it was detaching the idea of being lovely from being fair, which is an inherently basically racialist, racist, colorist idea, idea right? Um, now, there may be many teachers who use these kinds of products and talk about them openly with their senior girl students, right? The, this, this sort of thing happens. Um, so the teacher needs to be able to model that kind of behavior uh, hold a discussion in the class to make sure that students understand why that's important and why that's a good thing, uh, instead of letting students uh, hold on to the outdated beliefs, right? So the, the picking up on current affairs and small examples is a way that teachers can actively model behavior in their classes so that the right kind of attitudes are instilled. And if those attitudes are instilled with reference to kind of localized or national issues, then that's the basic prerequisite and basis for escalating that attitude to a global citizenship scale. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gandhi. In fact, uh, um, you know, one of the things that all of you said is that you know, the idea of global citizenship is also a state of mind and attitude. So Moshmi, now while that is obviously <laughs> what we would aspire to be, the reality is citizenship as a concept entails both rights and duties guaranteed by the laws of different countries. Conceptually, the very term citizenship is nation-centric, then how can educators effectively teach students to think about notions of global citizenship that transcends the rights and duties beyond a more restrictive understanding of citizenship within the nation state? In some ways, how do you transcend the legal duties and obligations that a citizenship could provide to transcend that 
to reach a state of identity and attitude that our other panelists talked about. Marshmi. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Raj, for this question. And it wonderfully leads on to the discussion that uh, my uh, distinguished uh, colleagues uh, here in the panel who have already spoken about. Uh, and specifically, uh, when uh, Mr. Gandhi was talking about, uh, uh, when we are talking about global citizenship, does, that does not negate the local and the, and the local concerns which are closer and something uh, Dr. Bindra and uh, uh, General also mentioned, it does not, uh, you know, often when people think about global citizenship, they think that uh, it's something beyond uh, the nation state or the local that, that, that but it, that, that does not mean that it negates or it excludes the local concerns. Okay, when we talk about citizenship, citizenship entails not just rights, but also duties enshrined and, and uh, by the constitution of uh, different countries, right? Uh, but uh, uh, when we are talking about global citizenship, we are talking about globalizing the very notion of citizenship so that uh, the rights, uh, we are not just talking about rights of, for ourselves, but we are mindful of our citizenship, our duties, also towards our fellow citizens. Uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the example that um, Mr. Gandhi talked about, how is the IS officer's uh, son or daughter uh, relating <coughs> with and interacting with a rickshawaller's uh, uh, son or daughter? Okay, how do we relate, how, how somebody from a particular, from a, a Hindu religious background is interacting with somebody from Muslim background? How somebody from uh, a certain racial background is treating and interacting with somebody coming from a different uh, racial or different kind of social background. So if each and every uh, student is taught uh, to not just fight for their own rights uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and duty as enshrined by the local uh, government and constitution within their own local setting, but also to take care of the fact and acknowledge the fact that just as they have their own rights, others also do have their own rights. Others from very different background who might be uh, from a different uh, nationality or a different uh, race, religion, gender, class, whatever background, to acknowledge the fact that, that we have our rights and duties so it's our right, uh, just as we have rights, they also have their rights, and it's our duty also to honor their right, and also, if necessary, to because of this sense of generation of the sense of common uh, identity and solidarity, to also, if necessary, fight for those rights of others. Thank you very much, uh, Moshmi, for that. Uh... Dilip, let me take this conversation from our distinguished educators to you. Now, of course, we have seen as much as these values are so deeply embedded in most of our education imagination, the fact remains that the last decade has seen a serious challenge to notions of globalism, uh, issues relating to Brexit and also strong right-wing governments coming to power across Europe, uh, the, uh, the election of a US president who you know, has consistently spoken about uh, making America great again in the sense uh, that some of the very fundamental issues uh, relating to uh, globalization and global citizenship have been under challenge. In fact, the current global pandemic has possibly created a new challenge of greater degree of economic protectionism on the one hand and also other types of protectionism, including issues related to immigration and movement of uh, people. So my question to you is that, how do we recover ourselves from the current situation that we are facing and to what extent education and educational institutions can provide leadership? Dilip. Yeah. Well, you're right. Actually, uh, there seems to be a bit of a regression from uh, the earlier notions of uh, one world and uh, you know, and uh, cooperation between people, but uh, I think uh, the converse of what you just said, the pandemic has taught you really there are no boundaries between uh, uh, countries, and uh, the the viruses don't respect national boundaries. So uh, I mean, by I think by a process of uh, compulsion, 
people will have to learn to cooperate. So uh, in the media, for example, in uh, education world, I've just finished writing an edit that uh, this warmongering which is going on, uh, you know, uh, between India and China, perhaps it, it has to be sorted out through a, a discussion and a, a bit of give and take kind of diplomacy. Really, uh, I feel that the kind of diplomacy we've been practicing in India is really is, is, uh, is uh, we, in, uh, we respect inherited borderlines. It's well known that when the British were here, they were, they were uh, drawing lines all over the place and uh, their whims and fancies. So I think there is a case on the other side also. And these matters can be resolved through, through uh, negotiation. And like Churchill said, jaw, jaw, jaw is better than war, war, war. So we need to just keep discussing things. And the, the kind of uh, rhetoric we've been listening, hearing in past few days about uh, you know, uh, economic boycott of China and so on, I, I don't think that is the kind of uh, isolationism we should teach within our education system. Because now the whole world is interdependent. Uh, we just You might have just read in the papers that 70% uh, of our raw materials for our uh, pharmaceutical industry come from China. And if we have this, uh, I don't know what, whether the general will agree with me, but if we have this kind of uh, uh, isolationist uh, attitude and that's being uh, uh, taught in our schools as super nationalism, as one might term it, we might end up shooting ourselves in, in the foot. And therefore, I think despite uh, all the rhetoric about uh, and hate and uh, antagonisms, that we are witnessing in these days. The duty of education institutions is to teach uh, people that, as many of the remarks, that we have a common humanity, we have common interests. And today, uh, in the age of jet travel, when you can get from one country to the other in three, four hours, really uh, nationalism is an outdated concept. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dilip, for that. Uh, we are live on Facebook and YouTube. I would like to invite uh, uh, the viewers to send in their questions after this first segment. I intend to take on your questions to our distinguished uh, principals and education leaders. Uh, Dr. Binda, let me move to you. Uh, you know, one of the major challenges that we are facing today uh, is the ethics of care for the others. Now, this, of course, concept is deeply embedded in the notions of global citizenship. However, there have been numerous studies, uh, even empirical evidence, uh, that support that students face discrimination at schools, at colleges, at universities for a variety of reasons. In fact, uh, these uh, you know, notions of deeply embedded discrimination could be on account of numerous reasons and, and the ultimate forms of it have come uh, in the US context today with the Black Lives uh, Matter movement. But arguably, uh, when you look at uh, the Indian context, you can make similar movements, uh, Dalit life, lives matter and other such things. So my question to you is that, how can we develop an uh, ethic of care for the others and get it embedded in the curriculum for teachers training, for development workshops, for our, the educational imagination that is embedded in the schools of our country? Dr. Mindra. Thank you, Professor. So my response to this question is quite, I, I'll take off from what um, uh, Roshan said when he talked about uh, uh, discrimination of some kind. Uh, uh, to me, uh, sadly, again, when I talked about teachers and principals themselves not being aware of the development goals, that's still, you know, maybe a little higher expectation. Many of them are actually ignorant about discrimination in, in letter and spirit. So teachers also have to learn. And like I say always, I teach, I learn, I learn, I teach. That's the way to go. The teach, teachers will also evolve. Yes, children do face discrimination at the hands of the teacher. But when we are all in it together, the teachers will also learn. I saw a very beautiful video the other day where a teacher in the US, and I'll take two minutes to uh, share with you the content of that video because it was actually very powerful. A teacher in the US, uh, a teacher of grade three. So when we are talking about grade three, we are talking about eight, nine-year-olds. I saw that, it was compelling, yeah. Yeah, and she talks about 
um, uh, she introduces the concept of discrimination to the children by saying that, okay, uh, uh, what is the meaning of brotherhood? So they say brotherhood means uh, treating everyone like our brothers. She says, is there anyone in the US who's not treated like brothers? And she says, uh, the children say, yes, I'm Blacks and Indians. They said that. Uh, I mean, grade three kids. And she says, okay, and why is that so? She said, because they're of a different color. So she says, is it fair? So they were quiet. She says, okay, today we're going to treat each other differently on the basis of the color of our eyes. eyes. She says, I am the teacher and uh, my eyes are blue. So the blue eyed children will get preference today. And then she does the same thing with the brown eyed children the next day. And she gets them to experience that tunnel of being discriminated. And on the third day, she introduces the concept of discrimination to them. It's very likely that these children will not discriminate against anyone on whatever basis whatsoever. Including things in the curriculum, excellent. Pushing it through, embedding it, excellent. But like Roshan said, it's an attitude. And that's the attitude we have to develop. And that comes by sharing common good practices, training, and all of that. Thank you very much, Dr. Bindra, for that. I think it was very important to recognize the aspect of socialization at, from a very early age, as opposed to bringing these issues much later in life. Uh, I wanted to raise a question that probably Dilip briefly raised. Now, one of the challenges that we are facing today, not just in India, but around the world, is that how do you develop a very, let's say, an enlightened notion of uh, nationality and commitment and patriotism towards one's own nation on the one hand, and uh, embrace notions of global citizenship, including appreciation of a, a more egalitarian sense of recognition of the other, not just the other limited to one's own, within one's own country, but even beyond. So as somebody who has had an illustrious career with the armed forces on the one hand, and as an educator, if we were to develop a framework on the basis of which we can you know, create uh, let's say, notions of citizenship that will hold a deeper sense of responsibility, where citizenship is about responsibility rather than anything else, how do we go about it? Thank you. See, first and foremost, uh, there is this tendency in recent times to mix up between nationalism and jingoism. Yes. Okay. I can be a very proud and nationalistic Indian, and I can still be a global citizen. Right? I'll give you an example. Uh, in the United Nations, in peacekeeping forces, Indian troops and Pakistani troops operate under the same commander. Um, our General Bikram Singh, a former chief, has commanded there. General Rawat has commanded there. He's commanded troops from other countries, including Pakistan. There is no issue. I have had Pakistani colleagues on various assignments. We were the best of friends. Today, when people, because I'll tell you what, as I said, it is more to do with the cultural identity than with a nationalistic identity, which is an artificial construct. So when it comes to culture, cuisine, uh, movies, tourism, there is a lot in civilization. There is a lot in common. The same thing our teachers and students experience when they go abroad. I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, our children are still amongst the more privileged, uh, you know, come from relatively privileged backgrounds in India. So let's say they go to Germany on an exchange and they suddenly discover some very wealthy people are actually not having any servants at home. You understand? I mean, it's a very mundane example. But when they come back and when this pandemic has hit, surprisingly, they suddenly realize the value of doing work yourself and not having some factotum, you know, to tie your laces or some such. I'm mean, giving you very ex extreme examples. So the other thing about nationalism is this. When you say that the soldier gave up his life for the country, please understand, nobody gives up his life for the country. He gives up his life for his buddies. You know, there's a concept in the military called small unit cohesion. He gives up for his platoon, for his battalion. You know, he doesn't die for the, he dies, he's wrapped up in the Indian flag after he's dead. When he's fighting, he's fighting for his buddies. So similarly, if we can inculcate as an ethos and not as a curriculum, because teachers are selected for subject matter specialization. Don't expect them to come with the skill sets when they come. But if the whole school ethos runs on seeing every circumstance in a global context, and we are all talking about our, our duties, why don't we see the rights of the others? 
the true globalization or appreciation of others will come from two things. One is appreciating the rights of the others rather than our duties. If you appreciate their rights, you will be more empathetic towards them. Right? This is one very important notion. And the other notion, which is very equally important, is that am I willing to subsume my interests to respect the other guy's cultural point of view? For example, in some, uh, let's say in East Asia, loss of face is a big thing. Correct? It also helps you tomorrow in commerce and other things. Uh, how you respect a Japanese guy, I mean, uh, how, how do you deal with him is different from how you deal with a guy in Dubai. Now, all this has to be brought in, not by teaching in a curriculum, but by an ethos in the school. And by every activity in school being underpinned by this notion that you go with your local embedded values from your family and from your small community that you come from, but see that where is the commonality with other people in the world? And you'd be amazed how much the commonality is. I mean, this forum doesn't allow for that. But. Thank you very much, Anil Kulkarni, for that. Uh, let me move to Roshan. Uh, Roshan, you know, one of the things that the, in current times we are conscious of is that what is the type of, you know, socialization and education that actually young people are getting in schools? Uh, studies have found that students are obviously keen to learn about global issues, but that particular aspiration is not necessarily met in many schools because of a strong focus on uh, the classroom experience, uh, including fulfilling the curriculum requirements. And so students end up uh, learning a lot about national and international issues, largely from social media. And I must confess, uh, you know, un through a lot of unhelpful TV debates. In such a scenario, when biggest influencer of thoughts happen to be those sources, how essential it is for us as responsible educators to create safe digital spaces for young minds so that they don't get carried away by the rhetoric of the news that is presented to themselves and in that process promote xenophobia and sadly at times even jingoism. What roles do you think schools have in creating a globally aware and a responsible digital citizen who is not only responsible, but also far more humble when it comes to understanding and responding to these issues. Well, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a great problem that children are learning a lot of their values and attitudes from social media, from poor TV debates, as you said, uh, and it's not instilling a very good attitude, certainly not instilling anything like global citizenship. Uh, but on the question of creating safe digital spaces, uh, I'm quite wary about that because I believe that it's not practically possible to shield children from the reality of the media that exists out there. We have to come to terms with the fact that children will inevitably be exposed to all of that. And there's very little that uh, we as school leaders or parents or peers can do to stop children from doing that. So what uh, schools can do and must do is empower children to be responsible consumers of social media. We need to teach them how to use it in a way which is responsible. We need to teach them the importance of verifying information and fact. They need to be aware of the existence of fake news and they need to have an attitude of discernment whenever they are accessing news uh, or seeing anything on social media so that they can uh, cross check, get a second opinion, discuss things with other people, uh, Google search, whatever they find out about, anything which seems controversial, uh, they need to be able to form their own opinion on it without simply imbibing the opinion that's coming from the social media. So no, I, I don't think that we should be creating safe digital spaces. I don't believe that we should try to shield children from the reality, but we have to just empower them to uh, use these materials properly. Thank you very much, uh, Roshan, for that. Uh, Moshmi, uh, one of the things that we in India and other countries can also do is to share experiences and also draw from other experiences. We know that in countries such as Philippines and Sri Lanka and even South Korea, the elements of global citizenship education have been embedded with, within their curriculum and national educational agenda. In India, of course, the national curriculum framework uh, way back, uh, you know, over a decade ago, talked about critical and child-centric pedagogies to prepare students uh, for a future. My question to you is that 
how can state and central governments make an important beginning in integrating GCE as a part of their curriculum and students' holistic education experience? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Raj, once again for this question. And I would like to share, you know, I think uh, the, um, uh, the National Council, there are people at the National Council for Education research and training. Um, they have been already thinking about this issue for, uh, for a while now. And uh, NCF 2005 does talk about these issues, but um, uh, unfortunately not much has happened uh, since NCF 2005 came in, in terms of uh, uh, you know, embedding it in the curriculum or in uh, following up with teachers training. Uh, recently, as you know very well, I was personally called upon as an external resource person to work closely with uh, NCRT, a project that was led by the Regional Institute of Education in Bhopal. And uh, we uh, did a series of workshops actually with NCRT faculty and staff, several teachers uh, from different schools, you know, uh, government schools, private schools, all kinds of schools, uh, you know, different work series of workshops uh, to brainstorm on this idea to see uh, how, you know, whether there's a buy-in for the concept of global citizenship education or not. And what we found out that as we were having, uh, doing these workshops is it was really, really hard to convince people uh, and uh, to make them understand and realize the importance and the need why we need uh, uh, to uh, integrate global citizenship education. And uh, the, uh, eventually, of course, uh, the handbook was uh, released. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there was no, the handbook is out, but the formal release of the handbook uh, by NCRT and also the follow-up teachers trainings got halted uh, because of the COVID crisis. But uh, the, the, what they were thinking, uh, I can share that with you, is of course the handbook has been created now and it's in English and a very well uh, structured way. In fact, the handbook also got an award last year from uh, UNESCO Asia Pacific Center as one of the best practices to promote a, a GSED a global citizenship education uh, through uh, school curriculum and pedagogy. Uh, Kunneet has seen uh, the handbook, uh, you know, and she was quite impressed. Dr. Shalini Advani also, uh, she also shared great feedback with me. Uh, but uh, what uh, we really, really need, uh, I think uh, this is high time. Uh, I'm sure uh, colleagues at NCRT and uh, Regional Institute of Bhopal that has been leading this project, they're going to further work on this and uh, local SCRTs, they have been also thinking about collaborating with the local SCRTs to translate the handbook into local regional languages and following up with uh, teachers training programs at the SCRT level across different Thank parts you. Thank of you. India. Uh, so I think that's, that's the way forward. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think one of the things which you mentioned is important because uh, there has to be a constant effort by regulatory bodies uh, as well as government agencies to advance that cause. Uh, so, you know, as we hear our distinguished educators, there is really clearly a lot of work that is being done at various levels within the school system. My question to you is that how do we, let's say, sustain these values as we move into higher education system? To what extent the transitions from school to college and then to workplace should retain and even further expand the notions of global citizenship. Because we know that the, the higher level of innocence that actually prevailed within the school, gradually the sense of idealism and even the sense of values, they run the risk of deteriorating as people progress towards their workplace. So my question to you is that, how, what kind of enabling environment that colleges and universities, but also even workplace can do and to promote the notions of global citizenship? Well, uh, obviously universities uh, by very definition have to be much more uh, uh, you know, diverse and uh, tolerant of uh, conflicting opinions. That's the whole uh, uh, joy and pleasure of a university 
uh, experience, as you probably know in your own university, in that you hear diverse uh, viewpoints, you're encouraged uh, to, uh, to debate, discuss, and you have a lot of time for peer-to-peer -peer interaction. And that's all part, I mean, uh, a part of a university education or higher education in general. In the schools, generally, uh, I feel that uh, while there are private schools and uh, some uh, the better ranked or the top ranked schools where, which are progressive, generally speaking, the textbooks which you get in schools and uh, who are the people who write the textbooks? Uh, you know, it's all uh, area of darkness, really. Nobody knows uh, these textbook committees which are set up in the States. There's a lot of nepotism in it and there's all kinds of publishing rackets. And we wrote a cover story in uh, Education Work on the India's Great Textbooks Racket. And uh, so therefore in the lower end and probably government schools, there's a lot of propaganda which is uh, uh, infiltrated through uh, textbooks and, uh, and, and uh, really this is the kind of uh, propaganda that uh, higher education institutions should make uh, children unlearn by creating a liberal conducive atmosphere, uh, conflicting opinions. Unfortunately, in the political space today, uh, conflicting opinions are, are, are being like uh, suppressed and squashed. And uh, there's a very little, as you said, very little uh, patience to hear uh, conflicting uh, points of view uh, or a liberal point of view. And there is a lot of this nationalism and uh, as, you, as you said on television and some of the media that uh, it's a hyper nationalism, which, uh, which is not conducive to global citizenship. And I think it's the job of all educators from school and universities really to make students understand that planet earth is we are all in the same boat together you know all these pandemics everything is global wars today are not local they can easily become global all this needs to we need a counter curriculum to the official curriculum and that curriculum comes from the enlightened teachers and also from parents the home curriculum should be a counter curriculum to propaganda which is infiltrated into school texts and I think that's a very important point that the educators should bear in mind. Thank you very much, Dilip. Uh, for all the viewers, we are live on Facebook and YouTube. I look forward to receiving your questions shortly. We have an excellent set of uh, educators talking about the future of education and global citizenship. Dr. Bindra, let me move to you. Uh, now, of course, we know that uh, we've talked about it a bit, but let me take it to the next level. Media plays a critical role in the informal education and influencing opinions of students. Uh, much of the media content in most countries, including India, ends up being far more focused within uh, what happens within the country and seeks to promote uh, different types of uh, nationalism, but also diversity at times. My question to you is that, what else can we do uh, and what role can popular media, including, let's say, films, uh, play uh, you know, a role for promoting uh, global citizenship? In fact, uh, uh, I have, uh, you know, since I moved to India from Hong Kong in 2008, I have traveled across the country and uh, I've delivered talks in some uh, 10,000 plus talks. And interestingly, uh, whenever I am at a school, I will ask a question to the school students. And I've realized how powerful, uh, you know, Bollywood could be, for example. And I asked the question, how many of you have watched this movie, Three Idiots? And it was extraordinary for me to get a response that every school I went to, literally from Nagaland to Kanyakumari, you would find 99% of the students would raise their hand. So my question to you is that, can popular media, including films, they can influence and impact and inform ideas and perspectives that will ultimately promote notions of global citizenship? Thank you, Professor. And uh, my first response and a definite response to that is a big yes. Now the trick is uh, how? Um, uh, we would know that we all love reading and we read for pleasure. We read some books they say are to be digested. Uh, we run clubs where we do book reviews. We run clubs that do film reviews. It's very interesting how this popular media has so much potential. I'll give you a personal example. In this pandemic, we all got hooked to Netflix and all of that. I 
started seeing a serial. My son was away from home for almost 10 years to the US and elsewhere, came back. And I, as a parent, I was always guilty of not knowing him so well. We started watching some te television serials on Netflix and we started discussing, Professor, you'll be surprised at how surprised I was to see my son's thinking. I'm proud of him and I'm proud of the way he thinks. Now, movies, again, if just left to be seen by the children, I'm not too sure how powerful they would be and whether they would be powerful in the right direction. But holding as an educator, holding book reviews, film reviews uh, uh, in the school informally, I'm not saying let's have a lesson and let's now review this film. Informally talking about films has a huge impact. I remember when this movie Bhagat Singh came and these children went, saw this movie with their, I, I spoke with a grade seven child and I just asked him very casually in recess. I was walking around, some kids were there and I asked him, I said, if India was to be under a foreign rule today, would there be another Bhagat Singh? You know what the answer was? The answer from one of the children, I mean, amongst many answers, one of the answers from a seven standard kid was, ma'am, there will be enough Bhagat Singhs, but would there be a mother of Bhagat Singh today? Now see, see the thinking of these children, how they are viewing their own parents as not being the parents of yesteryears. So films definitely are very powerful, but they need to be talked, they need to be discussed. And like, I'm coming back to what General Kulkarni, what Dilip, what uh, Roshan, everyone is talking about, the ethos, the attitude, the feeling, the passion for, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, uh, as members of the human race is what we have to instill in the children. And that's not easy. Fair and Lovely Cream perhaps is finding a second mention here in this uh, colloquium. But Roshan, I always tell parents, I'm not selling Fair and Lovely Cream 15 days in the case It's a long drawn process. It's a marathon, but step by step, little by little, like Malala says, one teacher, one child, one book, one pen can change the world. And media is definitely a very, very strong weapon. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bindra, for that uh, very, I would say, a compelling response because this remains a big uh, aspect of possibly uh, interventions that can happen in the school system. Uh, General Kulkarni, let me take you to one of the things that you briefly touched upon, which is about values. Now, sc schools and colleges and universities have tried to focus on uh, global citizenship. Uh, the question is that uh, how do we integrate this particular value that will transcend the ideas of curriculum reform. My question really is that with funding from education sector relatively limited, there are huge challenges for integrating a culture and set of values surrounding global citizenship. Is this, do we run the risk of having the value of a global citizenship limited to the privilege of the few or can we actually focus on a democratization of a higher education or a, a school education norm, which will transcend and go beyond the privileged few? Thank you, uh, Professor Rajkumar. 100%, if you had asked me this question 30 years ago, I would have been confused. Today, I'm not, because there is this power of technology to transcend distance, time, cultures, spaces. So therefore, what we are speaking here today, as you said, can be heard in Kanyakumari, it can be heard in Nagaland as well. So therefore, therefore, if you can create a medium which emphasizes this, but gives examples which are carved out in the local context. If you give some example of Abraham Lincoln's mother or somebody, uh, it's not going to sell. But if you explain it in the context, in Punjab, if you talk about Bhagat Singh, you know, it'll resonate. But the values underlying that of patriotism remain the same. So therefore, today, this huge tool is in our hands of technology, and you can transcend this. Similarly, schools can partner not only globally, which is amongst the better schools, but in India itself, in the local community, we are partnering with schools for sharing our best practices with them. 
Um, my, one of my favorite things about, you know, why everything doesn't cost money. And, and it's, it's a graphic I show to everyone of these little children who have carved out a carom board in soil, made those holes, and they're happily playing there. Okay, there is no resource, there's no government funding, there's no nothing. Okay, so similarly, some very imaginative low cost training aids have come up during this pandemic by teachers who are ingenious. So therefore, I believe in, it was a problem three decades ago. Today, if we leverage this te technology and with full respect to all governments, central or state, they are again a political entity, they will have an agenda. Whereas these values are universal. These values don't go with the, uh, this government in power or that government in power. I mean, you know, uh, sometimes even history is rewritten. But these value systems, which are, so I, I say, again, to use a tagline, let us combine our ancient wisdom with modern technology. Because what our grandmothers and all told us on their lap is true in the US, it's true in Ajmer, it's true in uh, Sonipat or wherever you are. Thank you very much, General Kulkarni, for that. Um, Roshan, there's a very interesting uh, dimension that we are you know, slowly getting in, uh, into, which is about you know, attitude and thinking and behaving. Uh, so global citizenship is as much about attitude, but also it's about behavioral change. It is expressed to engagement in the various communities of which we are all part of. Now, it includes several things, and one of which is about our ability to speak truth to power. Now, my question is that to what extent our school system is enabling our students to be able to speak truth to power and in that process to challenge authority, but also to adopt democratic methods and means with a view to seeking that challenge. The question is, are we preparing the next generation to challenge the power structures with a view to seeking transformation, albeit in a democratic way? Uh, absolutely fascinating question. Um, I think, you know, to, to speak truth to power, as, as you put it, um, I think children need to be empowered with two things. One is the what and one is the how. What is it that they're trying to speak to the power? They need to understand the issues at hand and form their opinions and then express those opinions. The other is the how. How are they supposed to actually convey it? Where, what is their forum? How do they make their voice heard? And I think, you know, to do that, first of all, children need to be empowered with uh, a strong sense of confidence, a belief that they matter. You know, they need to have a high sense of self-esteem. That's the basic prerequisite to actually being able to, to express oneself very openly in, in public fora. So that's where it all starts. And, and we can do that through a lot of means uh, in terms of exposing children to opportunities to develop their confidence and self-esteem. Uh, and it's very important that teachers uh, focus on the well-being of children so that that uh, confidence can, can be in place. Um, and then, of course, they need to understand what it means to live in a democracy. And they should understand that, you know, before in the previous answer, I said that it's a very practical thing. It's about attitudes and it's not a theoretical teaching. When it comes to understanding how the democracy works, yes, they should understand the basic theory of how the democ democratic process should work. Uh, and if there are aspects of the democratic process which are not working as they should, as per the theory, then the children need to be enabled to identify that. Um, because that is potentially a problem in the Indian state to some extent that, you know, the, the media is not always completely free and transparent. Um, it's not always easily possible to speak truth to power, as you put it. In terms of the what, of course, then the, uh, t children need to understand the issues that exist in society. They need to know what they want to talk about uh, in, in, and to express themselves about. And in order to do that, uh, it's about a process of engagement uh, in those issues, which I think is something that, you know, throughout the course of this panel discussion, we've discussed many ways of, of, of enabling that engagement. Um, and one, one more way apart from all of the ways which have been discussed already is uh, more in terms of uh, getting children to participate in events where people from diverse backgrounds come together. Um, I think, uh, you know, that, that's something which CMS has really emphasized uh, for several decades now, organizing international fora for students to come together on common platforms. Uh, not only to meet each other, uh, but also to debate issues, to understand alternative perspectives on issues. And I think, you know, picking up on what General Sir rightly said, um, if, if, if these events are only for more privileged schools, well now, 
actually we can do them online and we have been trying to do them online recently because of the pandemic situation and they've been remarkably successful so we're almost wondering you know uh, even when things go back to normal why don't we continue doing these things online even if we have the means and the ability to do it in person we might as well continue doing it online it uses less resources and it works extremely well uh, so that is how we can potentially enable children to understand the issues that they need to then express uh, in public fora. Thank you very much, Roshan. Uh, Rajkumar, I, I, I hope I'm not interrupting your format. Go ahead. But can I just comment yes, on one yes, thing? Absolutely. Please, sir. Go this business of questioning, the art of protest also needs to be, or the science of protest needs to be taught to children. Uh, there is this guy called Carl Malamud who, who invented the first internet radio. You might have known him or heard of him. Right? I called him over to my school to actually give a talk to my children on the art of protest. And I was told by my faculty member, sir, ye bhagavat aap kara do <laughs> So I said, no. And he explained very nicely, you know, six steps you must do, follow, if you want your protest to be effective and meaningful. Otherwise, you will just be a rabble rouser. And I'm sure you're familiar with him. And, uh, yes, no, I think it's, uh, and I mean, in, in fact, this is one of the most important uh, ways of uh, what I would call democratic education, in which uh, we need to invest and instill a sense of uh, character building, particularly among our young people. Moshmi, I have a quick question uh, for you. Uh, we're going to be moving into our Q&A session. I have 50 plus questions waiting for you. We'll quickly run through that. Um, you know, one of the big challenges is about the future of humanities education. And to what extent uh, this, let's say, gradual, uh, you know, threat uh, of uh, the death of humanities that is happening across universities and colleges around the world, and, and even to some extent in the India, in the school system too, how do we think that that is going to potentially impact our goals of, uh, you know, promoting global citizenship? Uh, unmute yourself, Moshimi. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Raj, once again for asking me this question. Yes, uh, there is no doubt about the fact that uh, um, around the world, you know, the humanities uh, uh, is in crisis. Um, uh, but at the same time, I think there is also, uh, but though it is limited to a few academic circles, but I'm also observing there is increasing movement of what academics and educators are now talking about STEAM education as against STEM. Uh, to integrate, even in science, technology, engineering, and math, you know, to integrate uh, liberal arts and humanities uh, in the context, specifically in the context of the sustainable development goals, uh, something uh, Gunmeet mentioned right at the beginning of this uh, pl uh, plenary session. session. Uh, so I think it's very, very important to raise awareness of this issue, the need for humanities. In fact, uh, there were several reports you must have read even in Times Higher Education in the recent context of the pandemic, in places like Germany, humanity scholars uh, and academics have been uh, consulted uh, with regards to even uh, making strategies or thinking about public policy and strategies with regards to uh, dealing with the uh, pandemic. Uh, so there is no doubt about the fact that humanities is extremely important uh, and it is something which really, really helps us. Uh, all those things that we talked about today uh, to identify common goals and, and to uh, develop this ethic of care for the others. Uh, when we read a work of literature or uh, when we admire a work of art, we don't think about nationality, we don't think about race, we don't think about uh, all other uh, social divides that divide us, right? Uh, we, you know, appreciation of art, uh, reading literature, it really helps us to put ourselves into other, uh, particularly reading literature or even media, uh, watching uh, films and movies and uh, you know, uh, uh, this kind of things. It helps us uh, emotionally, uh, you know, uh, empathize with others, right? 
uh, we sometimes you know even uh, reading reading a tragedy a book or even watching a movie we, we even tear up and cry okay so we empathize with people who are outside of us we care for others so all these values and talking about social and emotional learning which increasingly educators are talking about that education is not about just uh, cognitive uh, aspects we need to embed and how how better do you embed social and emotional learning without the humanities uh, so I think uh, it's it's our duty, uh, the kind of discussions that we are having in the public forum today, to raise this awareness uh, to really, uh, you know, humanities rather than uh, dying, uh, to really integrate humanities even within, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math education. So to moving from STEM to uh, STEAM to STEM uh, STEM to STEAM education. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Moshmi. That's uh, very important for this uh, for this discussion to happen. Uh, Dilip, you know, as we hear all our educators, one thing comes out very clearly is that for us to promote global citizenship, we need transformative educational leaders. We need people who can actually, uh, you know, take responsibility, but are prepared to seek that transformation within our schools and colleges and universities. And in fact, the foundations of that need to emerge out of our schools. And since uh, you, know, you have been looking at schools and how school education has transformed, uh, how do we create those educational leaders? What are the you know, uh, important, let's say, institutional investments that we need to make towards building transformative educational leaders who can indeed contribute towards development of global citizenship? Yeah, well, I think uh, what we need to do is really is uh, to create leaders, and uh, some of them will go into education. I'm I'm sure many of them, and uh, leadership is uh, created in uh, in uh, schools. In my opinion, not only through academic excellence. You know, you've got to have uh, schools have to, and this is what in education world in our rankings we we. When we rank schools, we 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 rank, we assess them across like some 14 parameters. One of which is academic excellence. So I think uh, leadership is built, as Wellington famously said, the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton. So like that, I think our public schools, meaning private exclusive schools, are doing a very they set a very good template in that, uh, like Mayo College and other schools. In that they they. they a lot of emphasis is placed on co-curricular education, debates, uh, reading, library, discussions, uh, games, which teaches you teamwork, uh, uh, and uh, assignments where people work in teams and collaborate. And this is all part of education. If you really want to build education leaders, and if you want to build leaders, and there's a huge paucity of leaders in this country, not only in education, but in every other field. Uh, really, the uh, most of our politicians, for example, they're not leaders, they're followers. They look at what is public opinion and they follow it. In fact, that's not the role of a leader. The leader has to take the public and make them walk behind him when he takes the right path, a difficult decision. And that's what leadership is about. And we need to, if you want good education leaders, we have to teach good leadership in our schools. And in the leadership template has been laid for our top, say, 1,000 schools, but there are, as you know, there are 1.5 million schools in India, and that has to filter down the government school system and the public uh, budget private school system, and that template is good. The, the so-called elite schools are not anti-national. They're not bad. They're very good for society, and that mindset change has to be, uh, be inculcated into Indian society. Thank you, Dilip, and thank you to all of you. Uh, we will, uh, what an extraordinary discussion that we've been having, and I appreciate your time. Let me quickly take up some of the questions that have come. Uh, we have little time here. Uh, let me ask Dr. Bindra. Dr. Bindra, there is a question. Now, a lot of teachers are watching this program across the country. We have over 500 plus uh, registrations, but many of them in Facebook and YouTube as well. Um, Ankit is asking, uh, what can a teacher do at their own level to impart global education and promote values of global citizenship among the students? 
Thank you and a uh, brilliant question because I always talk about the power of one. I always say, don't wait for others to give you a platform, create your own space. And if you are a true teacher, you'll find the resources and the time to, to transact to your students, whatever is your passion. So what you can do is, uh, Moshmi just spoke about the handbook that she has come up with. Believe me, it's almost like a Bible. Lay your hands on that handbook, read, read, read. You know, as a teacher, I must tell you, when I became a young head of school, I was very nervous and I spoke to the then retired governor of RBI and I asked him, I said, if there's one advice that you'd like to give me, what would it be? He said, Mrs. Bindra, read and teach your children how to read. Teach your children, instill in them the power of reading. And that's exactly what I want to tell you. Read a lot. Connect with different people, different teachers across. There are enough number of platforms. Once you go to the websites, once you surf the net, you'll find connecting classrooms and immense number of programs. Uh, equip yourselves, be convinced and be passionate. You will get a lot of material and people to help you find your uh, uh, resources to uh, deliver in the classrooms. Thank you very much, Dr. Bindra. There are several questions which... Uh, uh, focus on, uh, uh, you know, the role of uh, parents on the one hand and the engagement of schools and teachers with the parents. Uh, Rabinder and Ruma and Kushbu, many of them are asking, how, what kind of role uh, do school educators, including teachers, play when it comes to sensitizing and even engaging with parents on notions of global citizenship? Because there could be possibly conflicting signals emerging out of the home environment on the one hand and the school environment on the other? Yes. Uh, if you go back to the time when the parents were students, global citizenship was, citizenship was not on the agenda. So they have not had the experience of having gone through this, what we are going through today. So therefore, there's a need to educate the parents as well. And unless you educate the parents, the values that they are providing to their children are very good values. But where these fit in, in terms of tolerance, appreciation, mutual respect for somebody who's different from you, all this needs to be uh, highlighted. What is the context of global citizenship today needs to be highlighted. And what we must remember always is, and I, and I say this, we are a boarding school, so I say it often, that the child is the property of the parents. I only have power of attorney. How much how wide and sweeping is the power of attorney is my challenge to grab it from the parents. And that's a function of how much they trust me that look, what these guys will give to my child will be better than what I can give at home. But therefore, even in this pandemic, we've been taking the parents along. For example, I'm personally run the value education program for my school in the pandemic. I'm involving the parents and children. Small example on cyber ethics and cyber etiquette. All right, a lot of the parents have not lived in the digital world. We've been, we started by talking about it. Unless you educate them on what are cyber etiquettes, what is good cyber behavior, what are the challenges, how can a child be protected in the cyber world, what are the pitfalls of the dark web, et cetera, et cetera. You have to take them along in this dialogue. And therefore, the pandemic gives a good chance because you, you can reach out to the parent and kid simultaneously. So that is very uh, important. Secondly, we have to drive the whole discourse from two opposite ends. One is the end of prejudices. We all have our biases and prejudices. You know, when it comes to a matrimonial ad you'll put out for your uh, own son, you'll say, you know, bride should be fair, tall, whatever, endowed with X, Y, Z. You're showing a prejudice, a color prejudice, right? So teachers themselves have to shed their myths, dogmas, and prejudices if they genuinely want to impart uh, global citizenship learning. And they need to dialogue this first, get rid of it themselves, then reach out to the parents. And the second end is a utopian end. You know, uh, to quote John Lennon, you know, imagine there's no boundaries and no one to kill and die for. You get me? That's a utopian end. We're not going to get there. But unless you have a utopian ideal, and you, and, you know, encourage your children to think about the possibilities, we will never move in that direction. So these two wide ends of the spectrum of 
shedding prejudices and having an idealistic uh, outlook given to our children and educating the parents to my mind uh, is a combination that i think all schools must try thank you very much uh, jan kulkarni uh, roshan there are lots of questions that are focusing on uh, mental and emotional health of students but a part of that uh, is also about the fact that to what extent uh, even responding to mental health issues uh, schools can draw upon experiences from other parts of the world and how it can potentially influence and impact uh, behavioral aspects within a particular school yeah mental health issues of children have become a big priority i mean i wish they had always been a priority but the pandemic has really accelerated them to the forefront uh, because so many children are facing anxiety issues at home things are very uncertain for them uh, they're not used to this situation they're isolated they may be facing home problems their parents are stressed so this has become a real issue and it's affecting potentially their performance in class um so there are a lot of techniques which uh, are being developed rapidly that teachers everywhere can learn from uh, and and a lot of best practices are being generated i mean right now it's actually at the forefront of our priority so we are encouraging uh, that teachers for example should allow a certain amount of time at the beginning of a class just to check in with students informally ask them how they're feeling what they had for breakfast you know anything like that just to make them feel at home make them feel that they have uh, people listening to them uh, then we are trying to encourage our teachers to organize assemblies uh, for all students and the main purpose of that is not necessarily to impart information in in an assembly because the format is difficult but actually it just brings them all together on a common platform and uh, reduces their feeling of isolation it brings them back into a community spirit um and we want to give them plenty of opportunities to express themselves uh, especially during this time with all the online classes going on it's very easy to fall into a pattern of back to back uh you know zoom classes which can actually be very tiring and and back to back zoom classes are much more tiring than back to back in person classes just mirroring a school timetable is very difficult from home um so we're trying to introduce more asynchronous learning more children uh learning more through their homework assignments and through project based learning uh so that and and through that they have opportunities to uh, present what they're doing to their whole class um they might work remotely with peers they have the opportunity to work with their own family members as well in helping to make projects uh, and through that they're able to stay engaged with the community and and reduce that feeling of isolation so these are best practices which are you know being developed as a matter of emergency right now it's like the necessity has become the mother of invention but having developed some of these techniques i hope that they can continue even after things return to normal uh, so that we have new established best practices even for normal schooling uh, in terms of managing the well-being of students thank you very much uh, roshan uh, there are several questions which have come uh, on issues relating to uh, the challenge of the marginalized the disadvantaged and the disabled Um, Moshmi, are you around? Anyway, if Moshmi, yes, yes, I am. The question is that: to what extent notions of global citizenship can be uh, promoted even among the people who may not have sufficient access to education? In a sense, the heart of the question that Karan and others are asking is that: uh, how do you ensure that global citizenship doesn't become an ideal for the elite and le- leaves? a lot of others who don't get access to that type of education thank you so much for asking me this question in fact you know this question came up several times uh, during the workshops that we had at rai bhopal uh, with school teachers and principals and also several faculty of ncert uh, and right at that moment you know and since we were having these workshops in bhopal all of you must still remember the bhopal gas tragedy and what happened and the apt aftermath of it and how uh, people in the marginalized sections of uh, the society in bhopal are still affected because of the aftermath of this crisis right and un- uh, under this global pandemic we have all seen and we, we daily in newspapers also all those te- uh, heartbreaking photographs of migrant laborers uh, and what happened to them right Uh, so when we are talking about global citizenship global, we are talking also about the rights of those who are actually 
bearing you know the brunt of the pandemic or a tragedy like the Glo uh, bhopal gas tragedy or a tsunami or what recently even happened during the amphan cyclone in the northeastern region of india in various parts of the world you know the the biggest sufferers of climate crisis and climate change are those who are uh, at the bottom of the you know uh, pyramid literally uh, in terms of the global population so when we are we talk about global citizenship we are talking for uh, and also in the context of uh, the sustainable development goals which is talking about reducing global inequality right uh, to fight not just for our own rights uh, and and talk about our own rights and duties but to also fight for the rights and duties uh, actually the duties uh, gandhi uh, many years ago in his harijan uh, mag uh, you know magazine that he used to write uh, you know he, he he often talked about in in our society the duties have been oh, oh, historically more on the shoulders of those who are uh, in, the, in the lower rung of the society where as we are always talking about whether whereas global citizenship is talking about equal rights and duties for everybody not I, just duties on the shoulders of some people and the other people having all the rights so global so th this is this is this is what we have also explained in the handbook that we are talking about when we are talking about global citizenship we are talking about mitigating all these historic inequalities so that everybody will have equal rights and duties thank you very much mashmi dilip there's a question about the future of global citizenship in current day context meaning that to what extent covid-19 and issues relating to embracing of online education for example has both a challenge and opportunity for promoting global citizenship dilip yeah it is it is a challenge for people at the bottom of the pyramid as uh, uh, because uh, i mean let's face it uh, we have been the spending on public education for the last 70 years has been only about 3% of the gdp when every single uh, committee commission whoever has been set up have been saying let's spend more on public education public education by definition is for people who can't afford private education and uh, i think if we really want to make something of uh, of good education good global citizenship etc i mean uh, all of us have to put severe pressure on government uh, the the center and in the state to spend more so that the uh, quality of education which is abysmal Uh, today in uh, in uh, for the schools of uh, children from underprivileged uh, uh, households is is improved and uh, really uh, these kind of discussions and seminars and so on of limited impact unless we make a strong uh, advocacy for uh, greater spending on public education so that it everybody gets a good education it's only when uh, you have good national education then you can have good international education so i think we need to first cross that first step and get make sure that all children get good education good connectivity like you were saying uh, which is not the case today so that they can uh, uplift themselves and really we have to emphasize as we do in education that you have to spend more on public education so everybody get equality education for all and that unless we get that it's really pointless to have this discussion about a small sliver of people being very internationalized and which we are already but it has to happen at a mass level thank you thank you very much dilip so we are coming to the end of this program i have one last question to all of you it's the same question we have so many educators uh, particularly teachers uh, across india who are watching this program who will be watching it later uh, as a recorded version in the in the youtube uh, what is your message to them Uh, particularly with regard to how they can contribute towards development of global citizenship at a time at least in the near future some of the values of global citizenship will be under challenge at a time when countries will look at uh, issues to themselves and also issues related to conflict will be looming at large at that time how do educators particularly teachers across schools in india what can they do and how can they create an imagination 
particularly among the students on global citizenship? Dr. Bindra. So uh, my response to that question first is uh, a little technical, refer to the UNESCO learner attributes, which says, create informed and critically literate children, create socially connected and respectful of diversity children, create children who are ethically responsible and engaged. In particular, at the grassroots level, depending on what level you are teaching at. So if you are with the kindergarten, you're doing your job towards global citizenship education. If you can teach your children to listen to the others, to wait for their turn to speak, to stand in a queue, to respect the rules, you're doing your job with the five, seven year olds. If you are a middle school teacher, you're doing your job if you can inspire your children to have a cracker free Diwali because you're contributing to a healthier environment and preventing global warming. You're also introducing to them the concept of child labor, where little children burn their fingers filling in that powder in those little crackers. And in a very subtle way, you're introducing to them concepts of fair trade, concepts against exploitation. If you're dealing with a little more senior group of children, engage in discussions and deliberations. Pick up everyday issues, like Dilip said, China, why are we teaching children isolation? On the other hand, another equally learned man like Professor Wanchuk says, the, at the borders, the soldiers will kill China with their bullet. The common man will kill them with their wallet. We'll take away money from them and we'll boycott. <laughs> Engage into a discussion with the children. Let them develop their own perspective. Nudge them to think critically. Get them to understand how to evaluate situations, analyze logically. And then a global citizen does not just mean an aware citizen, a global citizen means a contributing member. And in that sense, if as a teacher at the grassroots level, you can do, you've done your job. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Bindra. General Kulkarni, same question. Yeah, I have two pieces of advice for the present community of teachers. One is for themselves. They must truly in letter and spirit become global citizens themselves. Nothing is more convincing for children than to see a role model and this involves a lot of work linked to this is the fact that they must analyze trends global trends that are emerging and see where will the world be five ten years from now no one can do it accurately but you can see a trend and you go to prepare your children for that world that they may go into that's one part of my advice to them and the second part of advice which goes to what Dilip Thakur was talking about that there is the thin sliver who are privileged to get, you know, who are even listening to this thing. You must create, and you can't do it for the whole, you can't scale up, but you can pick one or two other teachers from a tier three town or something. And because of the advantage of this digital thing, Roshan also mentioned it, reach out to them and offer them what they could do in their own respective way to prepare to become global citizens themselves and therefore automatically they'll pass it on to their children. So th that is an important responsibility the current lot of privileged teachers have to share, not out of sympathy, but out of the genuine good for our country for tomorrow, to reach out to teachers in smaller schools who are not endowed with our resources. So step one, yourself. Step two, create a small community around you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alakulkani. Roshan. Well, I 100% agree with everything Dr. Bindra and General Kulkarni said in general. However, uh, if I'm talking, giving a message to all teachers here in July 2020, it would be a slightly different message from normal because I would say, first of all, congratulations to all of you for adapting to this situation and rapidly taking on board uh, a brand new pedagogical style. And in this scenario, I don't want to burden you with new responsibilities of new ways of thinking and new things to do, but yes, when you have settled into your new pedagogy, when your online classes are running smoothly and your asynchronous learning is working smoothly, then I hope you will create the bandwidth to think about these issues and learn how to model them in your own practice in terms of raising discussions with students uh, on issues, making them sensitized to current affairs, making them understand how to engage with social media responsibly, and yes, taking care of their well being uh, in this difficult time. Thank you, Roshan. Moshmi. I would uh, echo all my other uh, co-panelists, what they have already sh uh, said. And at the same time, I would like to add once again, I think uh, 
care and share. Uh, these are the two big uh, major, uh, I think, uh, if, if you would like me to summarize the discussion for today, uh, today's topic on global citizenship, the two keywords that came up is caring and sharing. Caring uh, for others and also sharing of resources with others. And this is something uh, uh, we teachers, uh, we have to do ourselves as General wonderfully highlighted, the teachers are the role models. Uh, so if the teachers themselves through their own practice show care and show how they share, the students would learn by just observing the teachers. Thank you very much, Moshmi. Dilip, as always, you have the last word. Okay. My advice to teachers is read the Constitution of India carefully. And it's a wonderful document. And if you try and communicate the values and the aspirations that are embedded in the Constitution of India, you will not only create a, a great future citizenry and a great country, but you'll also automatically learn uh, internationalism and global citizenship. The constitution is global in nature, sorry for interruption, but it is global in nature. It has drawn from all the constitutions around the world, the values. Exactly. Thank you very much to all of you on behalf of OP Jindal Global University, the International for Higher Education, Research and Capacity Building. And of course, uh, my friend uh, Dilip Thakur and the education world, I would like to uh, extend my deep appreciation to all of you, Dr. Bindra, uh, General Kulkarni, and of course, Mr. Gandhi for your time, for your valuable insights, most importantly, for your inspired leadership and your contribution towards institution building for nation building. This contribution that you have made and you have been making for many years uh, is uh, critical not only for the future of India, but also for the future of the world. Young Indians, I believe, are going to shape the future of India and the world. With over 850 million people in India, less than 34 years of age, the demographic situation in India will shape the future of the world. And you are indeed shaping these young minds. And that is why values of global citizenship is so critical. I want to thank all of you for joining me in this and also thank all the viewers for participating in this um, locum. I also want to appreciate the questions. Unfortunately, I couldn't take many of them, but do watch us every fortnight when we come together to discuss the future of education. I also want to quickly thank my colleagues, uh, Moshimi here, but also other colleagues, Nandita, as well as uh, uh, Deep Mala for their contribution in putting this together. Thank you once again. Good evening and have a good weekend. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.